My grandma told me this story one time from when she was a student, and I always thought it'd be awesome to hear something read out in your channel. So I got her permission to write this to you, and I hope you find it as creepy as I do. My grandma grew up in Bolivia, which is where she got her degree, but for her PhD, she moved to La Quiaca in Argentina to study there. La Quiaca is a very old town high up in the Andes Plateau, and it's very dry and dusty too, almost like a town in New Mexico or Arizona. It's not very big either, and there's not much for tourists to see or do, so aside from people coming over the border from Bolivia, it's not the kind of place that you saw many foreigners, especially not many Americans. So one day, my grandma is having coffee in her favorite cafe when she spots a man who is quite obviously from North America. She catches his eye on accident, he smiles, then a few moments later, he comes over to talk to her. His Spanish was okay, but her English was better. He told her that he was a businessman, and that he was in La Quiaca to do some land surveying for his company back in the US. He said he was only going to be in town for a few days, but he was fascinated with the history and culture of the area, and since my grandma had been living in La Quiaca for a while, she told him what she'd learned about the place while she'd been studying there. Grandma said their conversation was very pleasant and that towards the end, the man asked if she'd like to have dinner with him the following night. He was charming and handsome so she agreed to what was basically a date and met up with him at a nice bistro the next evening. They got to talking about the history of the region again and at one point, my grandma starts telling him about this place on the Bolivian side of the Rio de la Quiaca. Basically, La Quiaca is the southern portion of a much larger town, but the other part is north of the river which chops the town in two in neighboring Bolivia. If you took the river west and stuck to the Bolivian side, you'd come across these incredible indigenous burial sites in the cliffs next to the river. Thousands of years ago, native South American tribes buried their dead next to the river and over time, the erosion of the rock means that you can see bones and burial artifacts in the side of the wall and in the water. My grandma had been to the site herself and told the American how incredible it was. He seemed very interested to see the place himself, but although my grandma offered to go with him, he said he much preferred to go alone. To help him get there, grandma drew him a kind of map and then wrote her phone number on the back so he could call her after his visit. But the next day came and went and the American man didn't call her. Grandma said that she was surprised by how hurt she was. She had enjoyed her talks with the man and although she never said it, I'm quite certain that she expected some kind of romance to blossom. She even went back to the same cafe they met in as well as the same bistro, hoping that he might show up to explain that he'd lost her phone number or something but he never showed. Eventually, my grandma decided to forget about the man. If he didn't want to see her anymore, she didn't want to see him, but forgetting about him wasn't so simple. One night, she had a dream that she was sitting in her apartment when the telephone suddenly rang. She picked up the phone, and in the dream, she knew that it was the American on the other end, even though she hadn't heard him speak yet. But then, instead of saying hello, asking how she was, or asking her to meet him for dinner, he started to weep. He sounded like he was very far from the phone and my grandma kept asking in the dream, are you okay, where are you? But he would not answer. All he would do is cry and cry while my grandma called out louder and louder, where are you, where are you? And that's the part that she always woke up at. Eventually the nightmare stopped and grandma just put it down to a few lingering feelings that she'd yet to get out of her system. But then one morning, just as she was leaving her apartment to get her morning coffee, she was met at her door by two policemen who asked her to identify herself. When she did so, they held up a very familiar little drawing. It was the map she'd drawn for the American man. The policeman then asked if she told the American to go to the spot depicted on the hand-drawn map. Grandma said that she hadn't told him to go there, but that he'd wanted to go out of his own free will and had refused the offer of her company too. She barely finished answering their question before they ordered her to follow them. They took her to the police station to question her and some of their questions were extremely upsetting for her. For a long time, they kept asking her different questions but refused to tell her why exactly she was there. However, it didn't take long for my grandma to figure out that if they were treating the situation so seriously, then something serious must have happened to the American. 
They asked her things like, how long have you known the American for and are you a part of any political organizations in Bolivia? She gave honest answers to both and the second answer was a no by the way but then the police questions got darker. They asked if she was part of any criminal organizations, if she had a history of drug trafficking back home in Bolivia. Again, the answers to both questions were no, but even though my grandma was giving honest answers, the police officers got angrier and angrier, almost as if though she was attempting to play dumb. Eventually, one of them exploded with anger and told her she better start taking their questions seriously because if she didn't, there's a chance that she'd be going to prison for murder and probably for the rest of her life. And that's how she found out it was a murder investigation and she didn't have to take any guesses to know who the victim had been. I think her reaction to finding out the American had been killed finally convinced the police officers of her innocence. She had no idea what exactly had happened to him, so she went from scared and intimidated to demanding to know if he was dead. Then, when they confirmed it, she couldn't help but burst into tears, for all sorts of reasons, too. First, she felt like if she had been with him, maybe she could have saved him. But that's assuming that he died by what you might call misadventure. And that wasn't the case at all. The police let my grandma go once she'd answered a few more questions, but this time with a very different tone. They couldn't answer all the questions she returned to them because it was all part of an ongoing continuing investigation, but it didn't take long for bribes to land information into the hands of reporters. The American's death hadn't been any kind of accident. It had most definitely been murder, and the police knew that because when someone had found the body, it was found headless, and the man's severed head had a gag stick in his mouth. Someone had cut his head off and then left him there at the burial site for someone else to discover. There are some good newspapers in Bolivia, but a lot of terrible tabloid-style newspapers too, and the regional papers are even worse when it comes to exaggerating stories to sell these newspapers. And one paper said the American was a drug trafficker, another said he was CIA, and another shamelessly tried to claim that it was the ghosts of the indigenous people claiming vengeance for sins against the land. There were all kinds of wild stories like that, and the police never got to the bottom of what happened to this American, only that he'd been bound, tortured, and then decapitated by unknown attackers. The only consolation my grandma took was that, because he was an American, it would only be a matter of time before the U.S. forced Bolivia to investigate properly. She also hoped that they might send their FBI or CIA or some other powerful people to solve the dreadful mystery once and for all. Then it would be international news, and accurate news too, not all the shameless guessing like that which appeared in local newspapers. But no one came. Not a soul came looking for the American. And La Quiaca is a small place too, so my grandma says she would have known if any other North Americans were in town. Then, as the years went by, the truth of the American's murder was doomed to remain a mystery until the end of days, when all truths are revealed by God. Grandma used to say that she looks forward to that day, not just because she'll finally know the truth of what happened, but also so she can apologize to that American. She said she used to curse his name in the nights after he didn't call, thinking he was off someplace else, romancing another naive young Latina. But again, he was lying dead by the river, after having died what was certainly a truly terrifying death. Back in the mid-60s, my grandma happened to be working as a teacher in the same school I myself ended up going to. Every morning, she'd walk from her small apartment all the way across an old park called the Heath, where wildflowers grew in the spring. She used this route every single day until she heard the terrible news that a young woman had gone missing, with the Heath being her last known location. For the first few days, the police wouldn't allow people to walk down the narrow stone path which led through the Heath, but even once they'd packed up and left, people were slow to return. Grandma extended her route for a week or two to avoid the heath, as there was a general sense of morbidity and fear about the place. But as time went by, a sense of normalcy returned and my grandma started walking through it on her way to and from teaching. She said she definitely would have thought twice about it if she had to walk through at night or during the very early morning, 
but most, if not all, of her walks were in daylight, and when they weren't, she'd organize for someone to come give her a ride. The girl was still missing, and the Heath still had that sense of creepiness about it, just not during the daytime when plenty of people were around. Then one day, my grandma set off to work, and as usual, she walked into the Heath and headed down the path. But then on this one occasion, there weren't the usual dog walkers or people using the park as a shortcut. It was just totally empty. This didn't deter my grandma, who kept on walking, and then moments later, she saw what she assumed was a dog walker, just kind of strolling around the edge of one of the grassy clearings. Grandma said that he looked like a younger version of Santa, big dark beard, thin on top, and quite a round pot belly that stuck out in front of him as he walked. He was just going along, minding his own business, almost like he was waiting for his dog to use the bathroom. But then, in almost the same moment, Grandma noticed that he hadn't got a dog with him, and he noticed her. He stared at her, for the whole time they crossed paths, and when he did, it was like his demeanor changed completely. He went from all relaxed and minding his own business to rigid and unceasingly staring. Grandma said the sudden shift made her extremely uncomfortable, and that she walked a little faster once she was out of sight, looking over her shoulder the whole time to make sure that she wasn't being followed. The man didn't follow her, but it didn't make the experience any less unnerving for her. She decided to avoid the heath altogether, and not only that, but she decided to start taking the bus just to ensure that she'd be safer on the route home. She thought that she'd never see the bearded man ever again, and nor did she want to, but just a short while later she did see him again, only this time it was on the news. It wasn't his face exactly. It was one of those sketch drawings the police used to release, but it looked exactly like him. Everything from the beard, to the thinning hair, to the dark, beady eyes who used to stare at her. She reported the sighting to the police, wondering why she hadn't thought to do it sooner. They sent officers around to her apartment to talk to her, and for a while she hoped that it might be what police needed to catch the guy, what with him returning to the scene of the crime and all, but it turned out not to make any difference. The mysterious bearded suspect was never apprehended, and the missing girl remains missing to this day. My grandma thinks she stumbled across him while revisiting the scene of the crime, and while he'd looked all relaxed without a care in the world, he'd been reliving the finer details of a terrible, unforgivable crime. My granny grew up in Ireland during the 1930s and moved over to the United States just after WW2. She was quintessentially Irish and although she'd never cared to make a return visit to her small hometown in Shannongary, she often spoke of it fondly. She said it was a wonderful place to grow up, with lots of open green fields for children to play in and the village seemed to be filled with all kinds of whimsical characters. There was the priest who once spent half a mass talking about how Jesus would have loved tea cakes, the pub landlord who once tried to ride a horse into his pub after winning it in a hurling bet, and then the village drunk, whose singing voice was so beautiful that he managed to make a living by singing dirges down at the village pub until closing time. The way she talked about Shannon Gary, it was baffling to think anyone wanted to leave in the first place. But upon asking her why she and her family decided to depart, Granny told me that she was only too glad to see the back of the place, as there was always, as she put it, an awful lot of bother going on. Considering the Irish Civil War was just fought a few years before she was born, you might assume that the bother my granny was referring to might involve some very sad and very violent stories. But you'd be mistaken, because each and every one had this tinge of morbid humor to them. There was the story of a man who fought a pig and lost, there was the story of the hurling champion who dropped dead with a smile on his face after scoring a winning goal. And then there was the oh-so-tragic story of the farmhand who was found drowned in a rain puddle. It seemed like even the deaths in Ireland had a humorous streak to them, even if it was a very dark variety of humor. But I think deep down, I was only tickled by Granny's stories because I didn't really believe that they were true. I mean, how the hell does a man drown in a puddle? I guess it's possible, but to me... It always sounded like a kind of joke, 
or a pithy one-liner that sounded better in Old Gaelic, something like that. Little did I know, all of Granny's stories were true. The story of the man who fought a pig and lost involved a prized breeding boar that escaped from a nearby farm and ran all the way into Shannongary. One of the village's braver denizens attempted to corner, wrestle, and subdue the brawny old hog, but cracked a skull on a stone step after the beast got the better of him and he died a few days later. When you put it like that, it's a lot less humorous than it first sounds and the same applied to the hurling champion. But by far the scariest story my granny ever told me was actually the one that I initially thought was the funniest, the man who drowned in a puddle. As you can imagine, there's a whole lot more to the story than a guy tripping, falling, and drowning in a few inches of water. Maybe there's a whole lot more if it's the scariest story I've ever heard. And I promise you, there is. But first, you need a little background on everything that ran up to the man drowning, so without further ado, I'll get on with Granny's story. So back in the mid-1930s, when my granny was just a teenager, Shanagary was a very small, very close-knit community. Things haven't changed much in the last hundred years or so. It's still a very small village of just a few hundred people. But back when Granny was a kid, it was even smaller. And I'm sorry to have to say it, but they didn't care much for outsiders. Maybe it was just a sign of the times and that anyone in their right mind would be suspicious of strangers following a period of civil conflict. But in Shanagary, this was especially true. And unless you could prove yourself a person of good standing, the villagers weren't too keen on strange faces just hanging around. And once again, I'm sorry to say this, but that especially applied to a family of travelers who rolled into town one day. In those days, Irish travelers were referred to by the same word my granny used for them, which is gypsies. However, that's not the word I'm going to use for them, not because it's the quote-unquote woke thing to do, but because it's simply quite not accurate. The term gypsy is a corruption of the descriptor Egyptian, and the Roma peoples were given that name due to the belief that they originated from Egypt. While the Roma might well have picked up some Ottoman culture or customs as they made their way through the old Turkic Empire, they actually originated from the Indian subcontinent and have a mysterious but very ancient history as a distinct subculture. Irish travelers, on the other hand, they're not from Egypt, obviously, or from India. They're from Ireland. Many historians believe that Irish travelers first adopted their nomadic lifestyles as a result of English oppression, and there's historical basis for that. Yet despite being ethnically distinct from the Roma, Irish travelers adopted a very similar kind of lifestyle. I'm talking horses and covered wagons, moving from place to place looking for work and then moving on when the money dries up. Then, I suppose just because of how people were back then, Every place they went, they were treated like outsiders, and sadly, that was the case in Shanagary too. When the travelers arrived in town, they took a look around and set up in a field about a mile down the road. Immediately, there was grumbling in the village pub with many wondering what the travelers' business was. But within a few days, they discovered that all the traveler father and his two grown sons wanted was a little paying work to see them through the coming weeks. It wasn't much to ask, but the villagers of Shanagary were already averse to outsiders, so coupled with the bad reputation the travelers had, their pleas fell on deaf ears. The villagers wouldn't even trade with them, refusing to sell the travelers so much as a loaf of bread, and it was all with the intention of sending a message, loud and clear, your kind aren't welcome here. It's shameful to think that people held such beliefs, but I suppose that's just the way things were back then. Yet instead of just moving on and trying their luck someplace else, the travelers stayed and as the days went by, things started to go missing around the village. None of the traveler children were ever caught stealing and according to Granny, they didn't hang around town long enough to steal in the first place. But the more things went missing, the more people blamed the travelers for their misplaced belongings. Maybe the travelers did help themselves to a loaf of bread or two. Poverty does breed desperation after all. But unless you're to the right of Genghis Khan, I think we can all agree that the punishment that followed most certainly didn't fit the crime. One night, roughly an hour before the village pub was due to close, the traveler father walked through the door, walked right up to the bar, and asked the landlord for a pint of his best ale. 
The landlord refused, saying that he didn't think the father had the money. But when the father slammed the right change down on the bar top to show that he did indeed have the coin, the landlord continued to refuse him. Is that the money you got from selling our stolen things? Someone called out. The father denied any such thievery, and a small scuffle broke out before the traveler father was forced to leave the pub. No one followed him, at least no one did overtly. They just finished up their pints, the landlord kicked them out, and he locked up the place for the night without any more trouble. As far as he knew, the traveler man had slouched off back to his covered wagon to lick his wounds, but as he'd come to find out, that wasn't the case. Early the next morning, a dairy farmer was carting a load of milk and cream into town when he came to a bridge that crossed a small stream. As he crossed, and from his elevated position on the top of his cart, he looked over the side of the bridge in the water and felt his blood run cold. There, lying face down in the water, was the body of a man, a man who turned out to be the traveler father who had been thrown out of the village pub the night before. Granny said she never saw any of it, but it must have made for a terrible scene. The local constable had to enlist the help of some villagers to pull the man's body from the water, and after hauling it onto a wheeled pallet, they delivered his corpse to his wife, sons, and his trio of small daughters. People in the village said that they could hear the man's widow wailing all the way down the lane, and even though they treated the family with contempt at first, there was a terrible sense that someone or perhaps a group of people, had gone way too far and done something unforgivable. The constable and his volunteers then left the traveler family to grieve, and the next morning, they were gone. The village constable issued a plea for information and said that anyone found guilty of the traveler's murder would be hanged for the offense. But no one came forward, and from what Granny said, this was for a couple of reasons. The first and most insidious was the idea that if someone had killed the traveler father, then he probably deserved it. It was common knowledge that there had been a scuffle at the village pub on the previous night, and someone suggested that he set upon a father who was stumbling home, drunk, in order to even the score. Then somehow, in the course of the fight that followed, the traveler was bested and thrown over the bridge where he bashed his head and drowned in the water. The second reason, and perhaps the most obvious, was that no one wanted to see anyone hanged because they'd gone telling tales to the police, especially not for the sake of an outsider who shouldn't have been in Shannon Gary in the first place. There had already been one death, why be the cause of another? But the third reason no one came forward, and the reason which had the most sway, was the fear that if the man's possible accidental killer was named, the traveler's two sons would come seeking revenge a revenge that would not nearly be so merciful as the hangman's rope. Weeks went by, and none of the travelers were ever seen around the village. Then, as weeks turned into months, people started to forget. A dark cloud had hung over the village for a short time, with some fearing that the travelers' retribution would be visited on them in due course. But as more and more time went by, folks started to relax, and that dark cloud seemed to disperse. But then one morning... Some terribly bad news swept through Shanagari, and that same dark cloud returned. The village farrier was found dead in a bathtub full of cold water. He had been drowned. Granny said that back then, they didn't have running water in their homes, let alone hot water. So if you wanted to have anything resembling a good soak, you had to buy your own big wooden bathtub, then fill it up with hot water yourself. The farrier's wife said that after coming home from the pub, her husband had decided to take a nice warm bath. He told her that he'd come straight to bed once he was finished, but when she woke up the next morning, she found herself alone in their bed. The farrier was a popular man, and seeing as it was his job to shoe all the horses in the village and surrounding area, he was quite a wealthy man too. His death was a big hit to the village, so he was deeply mourned by his friends and neighbors, but it was the circumstances of his death that truly terrified people. Seeing as the farrier was found slumped in his bathtub, head beneath the water, many concluded that his drowning was the result of a traveler's curse that had been put on the village by the father's grieving family. But it was only a handful of villagers who put stock in this, while the rest dismissed it as nonsense. A doctor from Cloyne had ridden into town to examine the man's body and had departed after declaring that there was no foul play, 
The farrier had died of causes that, while tragic, were completely natural. It made sense, since the farrier was no spring chicken and often spent his evenings drinking away vast sums of his daily earnings. The people of Shanagary might have been poor Irish village folk, but they weren't stupid, and when it came to things of an otherworldly nature, they put their faith in God and very little else. More time went by, the farrier's son stepped into the shoes of his father and life went on as normal for a while. At least until a farmhand was found, lying on a road leading into the village, drowned in a puddle. This time the signs of foul play were evident for all to see. The farmhand had been set upon while walking home from the village pub. His attackers beat him, forced him down, then held his face under the water of quite a large rain puddle before he finally drowned. Those who'd seen the boy's body dragged from the water said that there were cuts and grazes all over his face from where his killer had forced his head down so hard that it had scraped some of the flesh from the skull bone of his forehead. Now even the doubters were certain that a terrible but inevitable revenge was being visited upon the village and the culprits were obviously the traveler man's two sons. Once again, the village constable made a request for volunteers and they rode the surrounding countryside looking for any sign of the travelers or anyone who might have seen them. They found neither hide nor hair of the two sons and returned empty-handed and without answers. This, however, did not satisfy the villagers who felt that any one of them could be the next victims of a random and deadly attack. They organized volunteer police patrols to reinforce the already heavily burdened constable. Those that took to the streets would at least have a fighting chance, whereas those confined to their homes were almost completely paralyzed with fear. But one of them seemed much more frightened than the others. In the days after the farmhand's body was discovered, the Chandler's apprentice almost completely disappeared. Confined to his lodgings by some inexplicable terror, he paid a local waif to ferry all of his work to him, along with his meals and any other essentials. The only time he ever vacated his lodgings was to go to Sunday Mass. Villagers noticed that he prayed considerably harder and longer than before. Then once he was done, he made a generous donation to the collection plate, then his way straight home again. But always via the long route and never via the bridge that crossed the stream where the traveler man had been found. Then, one day, the Chandler's apprentice failed to open his door when the waif came knocking with his morning's work. After banging on his door for a few minutes, the young waif got scared then ran off to the village constable to get some help. A few minutes later, the constable arrived and after kicking the door in and walking inside, he found the Chandler's apprentice. The apprentice was lying in bed, having been beaten so badly that he was barely recognizable with his night clothes, his bed sheets, and the floor beneath him having been completely soaked through with water. Men had been patrolling the streets all night long and not one of them had seen any strangers coming or going. But still, the shadowy Avengers had managed to creep into the village and act a watery revenge against the now deceased Chandler's apprentice, then sneak all the way out again without being spotted. As you can imagine, the villagers of Shanagary were as shocked as they were scared. In the beginning, the general consensus was that the murderous revenge had been committed by the traveler's man's two adult sons, but by that time, Many people, including the village constable, believed a much larger group was responsible. Travelers have large families and even larger clan networks that divide and unite them in equal measure. Their petty squabbles are fought publicly and brutally even today, but when one of them is wronged by an outsider, every traveler feels aggrieved, and that's because they knew all too well that it could have just easily been them drowned in the stream that night. It took a long time afterward, but there had also been a change of opinion on another issue too. At first, the villagers believed that the killings had been random and opportune, but after the death of the Chandler's apprentice, when the supposedly random slaying stopped, they realized that they were the opposite. It hadn't been a case of, you'll kill one of us and we'll take three of you. The murders had been planned, targeted, and they had meaning to them. Out on the lanes, no one knew who killed the traveler man that night, but behind closed doors, everyone did. It was the farrier, the farmhand, and the Chandler's apprentice. Granny said that not much long after that, her mother and father announced that they were to be travelers themselves, 
only instead of roaming the Irish countryside, they were to board a ship and to sail to America, where she met my grandfather and the rest is history. All of her stories are as incredible as this one, it's just that this one happens to be the creepiest by far. I guess in the age of oil lamps and weak wind-up flashlights, it was much easier to sneak around at night. There was no CCTV, no infrared ring doorbell cameras, and nothing even resembling modern street lighting. But even so, the ability of whoever took revenge against the Traveler Man's killers, it verges on the supernatural, in my opinion. The ambush and drowning of the farmhand makes total sense to me. They just caught him in the wrong place at the wrong time and it just so happened to have rained that evening. But when it comes to the farrier and the Chandler's apprentice, it's like they're ninjas, or spookier yet, ghosts. They somehow killed a man in his bathtub so quietly that it didn't wake his wife, then got into the home of a man who turned his small dwelling into a veritable fortress of security, and honestly, they made it kind of look easy. But the thing that I find even spookier than those shadowy Avengers, who terrorized a small Irish village for weeks without ever once being spotted, is the fact that they somehow worked out who had killed the Traveler Man. I suppose you could say that they killed at random until they forced the guilty party into hiding or on the run, but that's not what I believe. I believe they knew. I don't know how, but they did. Maybe it's because they're just damn good investigators. Maybe one of them witnessed the Traveler Man's murder and was too scared and too outnumbered to do anything at the time. Or maybe it's because, on the Emerald Isle, there are much older gods than the Christian one. And while I'm not saying it's also something I believe, it sure does frighten me to think about it. My grandpa Hao was a Vietnam vet, and when he died, some of his old platoon buddies showed up to his funeral. I'd never met them before, and my grandpa had never talked about the war, so once the service was over, we got to swapping stories. They wanted to know what he'd been like in his civilian life, and we wanted to know what his time in Vietnam had been like. Things started pretty tame at first. My cousins and I told them stories about the times that grandpa took us fishing, as well as telling them about all the little eccentricities that he had, such as using rainwater to flush his toilet. They all thought stuff like that was hilarious and insisted on us telling them as many details like that as we could recall. Those old vets also insisted on buying us beers in exchange for our time and stories, so we were really scraping the barrel at one point just to keep the suds flowing. I'm joking, of course. I'm not going to argue with a dude who wants to buy me a beer, but... I would have hung out with those old timers anyhow, purely for the respect factor. I mean, they served with my grandpa in a friggin' war zone. I was sure that they had some stories to tell us about it too. I'm not the kind of jerk-off who'd go asking if Grandpa Hal had ever killed anyone, but it was only a matter of time before the situation reversed itself, and it was me and my cousin's turn to ask what Grandpa did in Nam. It turns out, he and his buddies were in a frontline army infantry unit, I can't remember which one, but apparently they saw plenty of action. At first, Grandpa Howe's buddies told us stories of all the mischief they got up to over there while on weekend passes. Sounds weird, but they made it sound kind of fun at first. Just a bunch of dudes hanging out in between long stints marching through the jungle. But then slowly but surely they started telling us other stories, and Vietnam didn't sound so much fun anymore. The things that really stuck to me at first was how young these guys were during the events they were telling us about. When I was like 19 or 20, I could barely tell my own ass from a hole in the ground, but Grandpa Hal and his buddies were these hardcore, disciplined as hell soldiers taking care of business in a place that could kill them in so many different ways. Before that day, whenever I heard the words Vietnam War, I used to think of helicopters, napalm, stuff like that. But one of the first stories they told me that really freaked me out had nothing to do with any of that. It had to do with the wildlife. You can't sleep in a hammock on a combat patrol in the jungle. To stay tactical, you have to get what little sleep you can manage on the jungle floor. But this meant that one night, Uncle Hal and his buddies woke up and looked over to find that one of their guys was in the process of being strangled by this huge python. They had to cut the thing's head off and unravel it from their fellow soldier 
all completely silently so as not to be detected by any incoming Vietnamese patrols. It was stuff like that which drove the point home that war truly is hell. But as the night went on, the old vet's stories got more and more intense. They said that one time, the guy next to my grandpa Hao got hit by a rocket. There was hardly any left of him, but an awful lot of what did remain ended up all over my grandpa. His platoon fought off the Vietnamese, marched back to camp, and then later on, Grandpa could feel something weird on the inside of his shirt. He unbuttons, reaches in, and pulls out a blown-off finger from the guy who got hit with the rocket next to him. But war is hell, right? And honestly, I didn't think it could get much worse than that. My drunk cousin actually asked them at one point if Grandpa had ever killed anyone, but they weren't mad at him. They just explained that it didn't really work like that. The only time that you were certain if you killed anyone was as if you blew up a bunker, whereas jungle firefights were all just guesswork. You had drag marks, a few blood trails, but nothing to really confirm that you actually zapped anyone. Whereas blowing up a bunker, sometimes it's such a mess in there that after you didn't know how many guys you'd killed. Plus, you had the two guys throwing grenades in, another guy throwing in C4, meaning three or four guys accounted for who knows how many kills. After they explained that, me and my dumb cousin started to understand what they meant. But then, something weird happened, and I'll try my best to describe it. The vets started looking at each other, and the vibe totally dropped from serious but cheerful to straight-up awkward. My cousin and I were in total listener mode by this point, just glued into these dudes' stories like it was the most interesting podcast episode ever. So instead of asking what was up, we just kind of watched as they started talking among themselves. I can't recall what was said, not word for word, but this is what little I can remember. One guy was talking, basically making the point that they didn't really know when or even if they'd killed anyone, just that they probably had when suddenly his words kind of trailed off and he started looking around the circle at his buddies. One guy started shaking his head, saying, Nuh-uh, no way, don't do it. Then another told him something like, It's the only reason we're here. One of the other vets chimed in with something like, Just because he's gone doesn't change anything. We swore. But then the first guy, the one who had been talking at first, he spoke back up as if though he somehow had authority and he says, Well, that's the point. Everyone's dead or will be soon anyway. We owe it to him to keep our mouth shut, but now that he's gone, we owe it to him to tell someone. And who better than them? When he said him, the old vet nodded at me and my cousin. By that time, my cousin and I were so in suspense that I think I was only a minute away from asking what the hell they were talking about. But sure enough, the first talker sighed and then addressed me and my cousin directly. He told us that there was a reason the four of them had traveled from all four corners of the country to come pay their respects at Grandpa Howe's funeral, and it wasn't just because they served together. Plenty of other platoon mates had passed away before my grandpa did, and none of them had them hopping on planes and trains and booking hotels. But when they heard Grandpa Howe died... They were making arrangements before they'd even hung up the phone calls that gave them the news. It was all for one very specific reason. As it turns out, my grandpa did kill someone in Vietnam. His buddies saw him do it. But before they told us the story, they told us two things. First off, if my grandpa hadn't have done what he'd done, a lot of soldiers would have lost their lives. And second... There was a reason they hadn't breathed a word of what he did to anyone almost for 50 years, and it wasn't because they were fans of keeping secrets. They were only telling me because soon, it wouldn't matter who knew, and I guess that's why now I'm telling you too. One day, my grandpa house platoon is walking through the jungle when they come across a clearing with a bunch of huts just sitting there. Thinking it's some kind of Viet Cong HQ, their lieutenant sends a few guys forward to check it out, but they immediately get taken out by snipers. It's not some Viet Cong HQ. It was a well-laid ambush, and right away, all the platoon are pinned down by more than one sniper. Their lieutenant tries to organize a retreat under fire, but he gets taken out. Then the platoon sergeant gets taken out, then the radio guy, and one by one, 
the snipers are just picking them off as they move or stand up. In the end, the platoon realize that they lay down behind trees, the snipers can't see them anymore so that's what they do. But some corporal, who's technically in command of the platoon since their lieutenant is unconscious and bleeding out, starts barking out commands and for some reason, some of the platoon are following his orders. They're rushing forward to try and drag the lieutenant back, but no matter how much covering fire they laid down, the snipers were picking their guys off every time they revealed themselves. This happens again, and again, and again, until finally some private gets an order and tells the corporal to go F himself. The corporal starts mouthing off about court martials and all this nonsense and then gives the guy the same order, but once again, this dude just tells him to shove it, because if he stands up, he's 100% getting a bullet. Then, unbelievably, the corporal turns his rifle on the private disobeying his orders and then threatens to kill him where he's lying if he doesn't get up and drag the lieutenant to safety. The private responds by pointing his own rifle at the corporal, but before he can pull the trigger, someone takes aim and blows the corporal's head off. Everyone looked around to where the shot came from and there's Grandpa Hal leaning out from behind a tree with this wild, terrified look in his eyes. And then before anyone can really process what happened, Grandpa Hal is throwing out a smoke grenade and then telling everyone to start crawling toward the sound of his voice. The surviving members of the platoon did exactly what he told them and they crawled all the way from the village popping thick red smoke grenades as they went to obscure them from the snipers. When they got back to base and they told everyone what happened, not a single person mentioned what Grandpa Hal had done. All anyone talked about was the ambush and how Grandpa Hal's quick thinking had saved their lives. Their unit commanders sent another bunch of soldiers out to blow the snipers away and rescue the wounded, but by the time they got there, the snipers had run off and stolen a whole bunch of weapons and equipment. Even though the patrol had been a disaster, Grandpa Howe was given a bronze star for bravery under fire. All the survivors knew he'd shot the corporal that day, and there were no illusions concerning what happened, but no one said a word because no one believed what they'd seen was a murder. If Grandpa Howe hadn't shot the corporal, there wouldn't have been any survivors. Every single one of them would have been picked off by the Vietnamese snipers. They knew he'd saved their lives, but they also knew that the army would never ever see things that way, and so they did the only thing they could do, and kept their mouths shut for almost half a century. Once the main vet guy was done telling us the story, my cousin and I were speechless. Not the kind of speechless that involves saying, wow, I'm speechless. I mean, we stayed quiet until we were asked a yes or no question, something we literally had to respond to. One of the other guys asked us, do you understand what we just told you? I said yeah, but I didn't and they knew I didn't, so they spelled it out for me. Your grandpa was a hero, not a coward, not a murderer, he was a hero. Then before things got too emotional they finished their beers, thanked us for their time and made for the door. What happened at my uncle Hal's funeral was something I planned to write about for a long time. I always told myself that if I had an incredible enough story to share, I could maybe turn it into a book or maybe even a screenplay or something, make a creative side hustle out of telling stories. But I'm almost certain that as long as I live, I'll never have a story as incredible or terrifying as the time my Uncle Hal saved his entire platoon by shooting one of his own guys. I'm not sure if the army can actually do anything about this, even after everyone involved is dead, so just to be safe, I've changed a few names and kept a few other things vague, just so this doesn't kick off some viral 4chan investigation that ends in TV cameras outside my parents' house. I want people to know what my grandpa did, but at the same time, I'm okay with just a few people knowing, because they're the people that matter in this story. They're the people he saved. Growing up, I didn't think it was weird that my grandpa was a vegetarian. Whenever he came over for Sunday dinner, mom would always make a side of eggplant parm just for him. He'd never eat any of the meat antipasti that was passed around beforehand, waving the plate away if anyone was forgetful enough to pass it his way, but 
As I got older, I started to notice some odd inconsistencies with his diet. Grandpa always ate the same Sunday gravy as the rest of us, with Mom using all that beef-saturated tomato deliciousness to bathe his fried eggplant before pairing it with pasta and serving it to him. I asked my mom if he knew this, and it turned out that he did. Grandpa didn't mind things flavored with meat. Hell, he'd drink chicken soup all day long, if it didn't have any meat pieces in it. The problem wasn't taste, nor the ethics of eating meat. The problem was something else. I remember the evening my mom called me into the kitchen to help with dinner prep, and while I was peeling carrots, I asked why Grandpa didn't like to see the meat he was eating. I guess she figured she had two options. Tell me, and ensure that I never, ever ask my grandpa about it in person. Or don't tell me, and risk him telling me the story in much more graphic detail while dredging up some terrible memories in the process. So she took the first option and decided to just tell me. I knew my grandpa had been a sailor at some point during his younger years, and I also knew that he'd been in the Navy during WW2. But at that age, I was incredibly ignorant of world history, so... When I heard he sailed in the Pacific, transporting marines from place to place, it didn't mean all that much to me. I figured that since he was a sailor and not a soldier, all he did was sail around hoping a submarine didn't catch him while the soldiers did all the shooting and blowing stuff up. Now technically speaking, that's true. Sailors had a very different kind of war out there. But I was always under the impression that Grandpa had been lucky for want of a better word, and that he'd never seen anything too gruesome or scary during his time in the Navy. And boy, was I wrong about that. My mom told me that during the war, Grandpa had served on what she called an amphibious assault ship. These guys transported the Marines from island to island and from battle to battle, but they also did a whole bunch of other stuff. They kept them fed, watered, and supplied with what they needed to fight, then, whenever the Marines took a place from the Japanese, sailors from the amphibious assault ships would follow on behind them, doing all the stuff that they needed to be done after battle, and that included cleanup. The moment my mom said the words cleanup, it suddenly clicked why Grandpa didn't like the sight of meat. In my defense, I was only maybe 13 or 14 at the time, and like I said, I knew next to nothing about history aside from, like, presidents and a little about the Revolutionary War. So when my mom spelled it out to me that Grandpa had been on what amounted to a battlefield cleanup crew, it was like this sickening moment of realization before I suddenly just felt terrible for him. Mom said that when he and his crew came ashore, that they had to gather up the remains of all the dead Marines, but also all the dead Japanese too. He can't have dead bodies lying around in places as hot and humid as the South Pacific Islands. They start decaying super fast, and they're breeding grounds for flies, and if just one of those disease-spreading flies gets onto a ship, sickness could take out an entire crew within days. That meant that cleaning up all the death the marines left in their wake was an extremely important job, but an extremely dirty and unsettling one as well. Sometimes it was used as a punishment, but for the most part, only the men with the strongest stomachs and the sturdiest minds were consistently chosen for each cleanup crew. And even though it seems like the highest of compliments that my grandpa was one of those picked, as it most definitely wasn't a punishment in his case, it still took a subtle but evident toll on him. It wasn't just carting all the bodies around, all that meat that made grandpa never want to see it on his plate again, it was other stuff that really turned him off of it. For example, he once came across a guy trying to remove gold teeth from the mouth of a dead Japanese soldier. The guy couldn't get one of his back teeth, so he just started sawing into his jaw with his combat knife to try and remove the chunk that the gold tooth was attached to. He said sawing into a steak or pork chops reminded him too much of that sailor, sawing away with that sick grinding sound, determined to get at that gold tooth. Then the other thing, the thing that gave him nightmares until long after he came back home, was something that he saw at this place called Lete. The landings took place at high tide, so the soldiers could get right up onto the beach, but that meant that when Grandpa and his cleanup crew came in, there were a bunch of bodies floating in the surf, and the tide was rapidly retreating. Naturally, they tried to get all the American bodies out of the water, and only then did they try to preserve the Japanese dead. But by the time all the deceased Americans were out of the water, a whole bunch of Japanese ones had been pulled further out, 
and it attracted a whole bunch of hungry sharks. There was nothing they could do but carry on putting together what they had on the beach, all with the sharks feasting away in the background, ripping off pieces of meat before swallowing them down in a rush of water. And the next tide, all these chunks of meat and bone in uniform got washed up on the beach, meaning Grandpa and the cleanup crew basically had to do their job all over again. And only this time, the stuff that was left of the Japanese soldiers was all chewed up and half-eaten. After that, Grandpa lost his appetite for meat, and in a way, I don't blame him. I'm just glad it came up before I asked him about it, because God knows I'd never want to remind him of something so hellishly traumatic. Mom said that he had nightmares for a long time after the war, but not over what those sharks did with those dead Japanese soldiers who got drug out to sea. The thing that screwed him up the most, that had him waking up in the middle of the night screaming in a cold sweat, were the things people could do to each other, not with their guns or their bombs, but with their bare hands. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered to the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations, and they're located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, all I want for Christmas is you.